Welcome to Coding Shorts. My name is Sean Wildermuth. I've been away a little bit, I've been a little sick, so I'm going to be getting back on track and of doing these at least once a week. With .NET 7 being recently released, I did want to explore some changes. And one of the complications that always was really hard to teach and implement was JWT tokens. So the idea behind JWT tokens is that you can have a magic string that can be validated by the server to know someone has a certain number of rights. But I want to show you how they've changed it in .NET 7 to make it much more applicable to what you want to do getting started. The amount of code has been greatly reduced and in fact has added a secret new tool that we're going to get to use to go ahead and generate our own tokens at development time. Let's take a look. And the space we find ourselves in is I'm just in a source directory and I'm going to start from a brand new project. So I'm going to create a new web API and I'm just going to call it 7 off and I'm going to put it in the same directory. This is going to create a really simple project for us. And just to walk through it very briefly, if you've done .NET at all, you'll be pretty familiar with all of these. Let's go ahead and make sure it's going to build those. And we basically have a program.cs that is pretty simple and adds controllers because we're going to be creating, we're going to be using an API that's a controller based, though everything I'm talking about here works with minimal APIs incredibly well. In fact, it doesn't need to change in any way, whether you're using controllers or you're using minimal API. And so we register and map our controllers. And in our case, we only have one sample controller called the weather forecast controller. And if we do a get on the endpoint of weather forecast, we're going to get some data out of it. Super, super simple, right? We don't need to worry about what this is too grandly. In fact, if we go ahead and run this, now I'm going to use watch because I want it to rebuild every time we need. And we'll see that it's automatically got Swagger set up. So we could actually go ahead and call this get directly using Swagger, though we're not going to be using Swagger for it. Let's try it out. Let's execute it. And we can see that it, we got some data. And what we're returning here isn't important with what we're doing. What we want to do is protect this behind authentication. And the authentication is going to be using JWT tokens, I hate to use JWT tokens, but JWT bearer tokens specifically to protect this API from being called. There's a lot of ways you can configure this, but to be able to authenticate it quickly is one of the goals of .NET 7 and further out in .NET 8, they want to make this much, much simpler than it is. So back in our code, we're going to make a couple of small changes. I'm just going to get that out of our way. We're going to leave this as it is, and we're going to go up here to program.cs. And what we want to be able to do is just add builder services, add authentication. And so if you used add authentication before or used templates that already put it in there before, you'll know that it has this idea of a default scheme that is no longer necessary. It's actually taking all the schemes that are added to authentication and doing them in order. And so if we add authentication here, it'll actually be utilized by add authorization down here. Now, we also used to need before .NET 7 use authentication after this as well. And it's no longer necessary. This will see whether authentication has been added and add the middleware for authentication if we need it. So we've uh, added the authentication. Nothing should feel like it's really changed. And if we um, go back to our controller and let's go ahead and tell it that we want to authorize this controller. In other words, nobody gets in unless we have validated them, at least as a user. We could have other claims here later to say they have to be a certain kind of user. And I'm going to use the Thunder client here. And here's our weather forecast. And let's go ahead and send it. And we'll see that by just adding that authentication, we're saying no authentication scheme was specified. And so it doesn't know what to do when you say, I want it to be authenticated, but I haven't told it how I want to do authentication. Now, the common way in a lot of projects is to come off here 
and use the fluent syntax to say add cookie, right? You want to use cookie authentication and all that's great. And we can still do that. We could add cookie as well as JWT, but in this case, I want to really talk about JWT. So let's come here and let's create a new terminal. And I'm going to call .NET add package. And I'm going to add Microsoft ASP.NET Core authentication JWT bearer. Now, one of the interesting things here is I'm using Visual Studio Code. You would just do, use your NuGet manager to add the same library, but I'm trying to be a little cute. Adds a bunch of stuff, and once it does, we'll be able to add on the end of authentication JWT bearer now. What's interesting about this is we no longer need to have a long set of code in here to configure the audience and the authority and all of that. You could still do it if you have existing code that does this, not a problem. But what they've made this uh, to support configuration through what else? Configuration. So this is going to try to read that basic configuration if we have it and use those values. Go back to our .NET, tell it to rebuild because we added a NuGet package and all that. So it's back up. And let's go back to our call. And we can see it's unauthorized now because it hasn't received any information in the form of a JWT bearer token. But if we go to the auth tab here, by the way, this is using the Thunder client add-in. You could be using Postman to do this. It's a little harder to do it in Swagger, but it's certainly possible there. And by using auth, we can set the bearer token to a magic JWT token. And this has always been the hard part is, well, I'm going to have to write code to generate one of these because I'm the only one that knows all the secrets about this. And this is one of the things that's been very interesting is .NET has added a new tool that's installed by default called user JWTS. And all this does is allows you to create a new JSON web token. But how does it know to do that? It's actually looking in your project for the default values. So let's go ahead and use this and just say dot net user token create. It's going to generate one based on our project itself. Now one of the interesting things it did here is it said, okay, I'm going to create a new one with the name from my machine name and I have this magic token now. If I go back up here and supply that bearer token, this time we're getting it back. Now how the heck did that happen? How did it know about what was in our bearer token? Well, what was sneaky about that tool was they actually went into your app settings.development and set up the bearer token scheme configuration. It said, hey, the issuer, and this is what the tool adds as the issuer in the GWT when it generates it, this is the only one that's valid. And then these are the addresses that my project knows about that they might be executing on. And so as long as it has this, it's, it has good default for everything else. But you can see here that authentication schemes and then bearer are going to have a schema for defining different kinds of authentication schemes. It might not just be bearer in here. It could be um, uh, OIDC. It could be all sorts of different kinds of authentication schemes that can be in here. Even cookie values can be configured in here now. But this didn't exist in our project to begin with. This was specifically added when I used the tool. And so it validated against these. In fact, if we look at the bearer token, and we go to the magic JWT.io, and let's paste in our token, what is it? It's just basically saying the unique name is that username I have, which happens to be my name. The issuer, and it's using this to validate it, is right there. And then it has uh, expiration and some other values here that it will know about. So it has a long time because it's a development one. And we're saying that as long as this is one of the audiences, this is one of the websites we're running it from, this should work perfectly fine, right? So it's not doing anything magical here. It's just doing sort of the default behavior. The default behavior becomes the right thing to do. And I think that's why this becomes a whole lot simpler. 
Now I've talked about this and have some code examples on my blog about this very notion. In fact, I'll include this video in the blog after I publish it. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, but I'll have the link in the show notes just at the bottom of the video if you want to go look at it in text instead of trying to follow exactly what I've done here. There's also a demo that you'll be able to download. So I hope you've learned a little about how it's changed development with JWTs and made it easier for development. I am obliged to ask you if you've gotten this far, please like that video and subscribe if you can. You'll get notifications about all my new videos and because they're a little sporadic, getting that notification can really help. Thanks again.